There we go. Yeah, very good. Maybe a small group tonight, but we'll see uh, see who shows. Um, smaller group tonight. I had a great experience with that. Um, th there's this person who couldn't get her red dot finder to work. Oh, I was I was wondering. I forgot all about that. So anyway, she, you she did meet on Saturday to my house, mm -hmm. and um, you know, sure enough, it wasn't working. And all I could think of was to take it apart and try to diagnose it which we, we did. I brought up my tools and we pulled the whole thing apart. Every component was apparently working. We put it back together again and it's working. <laughs> this, this is the best way to, to, uh, to repair things. It's, I mean, it happens all the time to me. It happens to me all the time. <laughs> you take it apart, you put it back together again. Did it, does it, did it use one of those uh, 2023 cells? Little button batteries. Yeah, I think it's one of those, uh, Dave. It's, it's one of the yeah. uh, pill batteries, but we yeah, change sometimes, those, of course. Sometimes those cells get a little oxide coat on them, and you need to wipe them clean before you put them in. Well, the so first thing we did is we tried down. a new one, and but, I put my voltmeter to it, and it was fine. Okay. Sometimes they're just upside down too. I think it was the switch. I think the switch needed to. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the the Celestron site uh, uh, talks about the the little finger that holds it down. They they tell you to push it down a little bit to make sure it has good contact. That's basically what they tell you. So that's, I think that's actually by, quite common. I think just by touching it, it clicked it into place. Hmm. Yeah, so maybe see. just just uh, just an oxidized switch, maybe. Wow. Yeah, I, I have a little can of. Uh, uh, contact cleaner that I use on stuff like that. Just give it a quick squirt, oh. wipe off the excess, and quite often that solves those little intermittent problems. Yeah. You can get it at Quail Electronics. It'll last for 20 years. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a can from Radio Shack. <laughs> How long yeah. has it been since we've had a Radio Shack? <laughs> yeah, probably 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. yeah. The new ones have some coating on them that taste bad so that uh, kids won't eat them. At least that's the one I just bought. Has that yeah. on? So I licked it to see how it was. Quite how was it? <laughs> you don't look green. <laughs> You're also not lighting up. Got anyway. a better red dot finder. It's a lovely telescope she bought, but I told her to get the the better Celestron one from Bruce. Yes, the one that's a little bigger. Yeah, it's bigger and it's got a circle rather than a dot. Yep. Bruce says the cholesterol, you know, is scrimping on the, on that, and and so if you buy the eighty dollar instead of the forty dollar finder, it's much much better. I should probably buy one of those to stick on my camera's uh, hot shooters if I'm trying to aim the camera at something, because the current red dot finder doesn't work too well for that. I think they make them with the hot shoe actually. Yeah, yeah. They weren't readily available when I needed one, so I ended up putting an extremely heavy um, uh, set of uh, adapters, so it, it sits quite tall, which is not very good. Yeah, well, my old red dot has, I have a little plastic piece that fits on the hot shoe that's got an adapter for the red dot, and that's really flaky. Is a, is a polite word. <laughs> well, we're a little after uh, 25 to, and uh, that may be um, it for this evening for uh, uh, 17 attendees. So maybe we'll, um, we'll get started. So we've got some uh, technical discuss discussion going on and uh, that's good about uh, solution techniques and that. Um, two people have approached me so far about saying some uh, something tonight. We've got Reg, uh, who wanted to talk about the Crab Nebula, and Lori to talk about a couple of items uh, upcoming. Is I mean, there anybody else? Hmm? Got to uh, the Event Horizon Telescope picture from this last week. Okay, so Rana yeah. and David. Uh, six, six for next week. Okay, David, yeah. 
nothing from Edmonton this week. Uh, it's been no. pretty smoky up there. Uh, but in a couple of weeks, I might have something from Arnold Rivera. He's uh, building himself a brand new All Sky camera. Oh. And he's got it outside and he's taken a few shots, but he needs to tweak it a bit. Once he gets a couple of good shots, I'll collect all the photographs of what he's put together. You might find the interesting how he built his All Sky camera. Yeah, I was going to say that would be of interest. Is what did he yep. build it with? And yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, so I've got now Reg, Laurie, Randy, and David. Anybody else? Okay, Sir Reginald, you may take it away. <laughs> yep, yep. Sorry about that. Uh, I have a share screen button, so maybe my uh, computer is... Uh, not uh, protected. So I'm going to try and do that at this time. And I can you see anything different? Yep. Yeah, it is there. Okay, so I'll play from the start. Um, my uh, objective tonight is to blow your minds. Uh, and I think I'm going to do it. Uh, this is called The Heart of the Crab, and I came across something that was published uh, on the uh, Canada-France-Hawaii telescope site in February, and I've been dying to talk about it ever since, but I only now got my act together, and I noticed that in the latest edition of uh, the RASC journal, um, Mary Beth uh, has uh, Lejack has um, uh, basically got uh, mentioned uh, the heart of the crab uh, story in there. So uh, she before before anybody reads it, I thought I'd jump in here. So let's see if we can get this going. Um, so first of all, M1 the crab nebula. It was discovered in 1731 by John Beavis. It was rediscovered by Charles Messier in 1758. And although cloudy like a comet, it didn't move. And this is the uh, object that inspired Messier to compile his famous catalog. And there's a, a picture here by Lord Ross in 1844 using a 36 inch telescope. And uh, he sketched this uh, image of uh, M1 and he thought it looked like a crab. I think it looks more like a pineapple or something. I never never uh, get along with uh, these things. Uh, when he upgraded his scope to a 72 inch, he said that it didn't look the same, but he couldn't get rid of the name by that time. So it's uh, Crab Nebula forever. Um, here's another sketch of the Crab Nebula taken by Philip Thies uh, in October 76. Uh, many of you remember Philip uh, was a, an active member of the Victoria Center and he won the Chilton Prize for uh, writing a, a, his uh, uh, books on astronomy with Jack Newton. And he recently passed and we were delighted to get a collection of uh, 108 or 109 images that he sketched of all of the Messier objects. And you can see a little bit of a smudge down here. Hopefully you can see my... Uh, um, uh, cursor, but uh, essentially uh, this is uh, his image of uh, Crab Nebula, and the crab is in Taurus, and um, it's a fairly large thing. It's about uh, the the actual width of the Crab Nebula is about a, a sixth of the diameter of the Moon. So there you go. Um, now here's a another rather pitiful image that is taken by me a 6.5 minute exposure of the crab. And I just wanted to show you this, there's a reason for it. Um, uh, basically, there's a little notch in here. And um, uh, this was my first effort on the crab, but was just, I, I had a few minutes to bag some photons before I went to another object. So I'm not uh, over too proud of that. But this is a beautiful image of the crab nebula enhanced with hydrogen alpha. It uh, is uh, taken with Gary Sedan's 20 inch uh, scope. 
And uh, it had, uh, they, instead of 6.5 minutes, they had 4.15 hours of uh, exposures. Um, and they also had uh, uh, 16 times more uh, uh, area to gather light on. So I worked it out, there's over 4,000 times more light captured than that previous image. But they also have a little bit of a notch in here that I saw as well. Um, and I, I just love this image and it shows uh, all sorts of interesting structure. You can see all sorts of filaments in there. And um, in particular, you've got hydrogen alpha and uh, another other, a bunch of other light sources in there. There's plenty of stuff going on in this uh, particular object. So uh, you'll hear a lot about it tonight. And this is M1 taken from the Canada, France, Hawaii, 3.6 meter telescope, a little bit more detail. And it's using a, an absolutely magical instrument called CITEL. Uh, it's a joint collaboration between the University of Laval, ABB Incorporated Quebec, the University of Montreal and the Canadian French Hawaii Telescope. And the leadership uh, or the project leader for developing CITEL is uh, Laurent Dessen. And one of his PhD students, Thomas Martin, just worked wonders getting data with this thing. And uh, because it is involves a uh, supernova, they engaged the help of uh, Danny M. I won't pronounce, attempt to pronounce his name, from Purdue University, who's an expert on supernova. And they wrote a really interesting paper uh, on this and uh, it was released in January of this year. So the Crab Nebula, um, well, it was interesting. John Duncan uh, showed in 1921 by comparing pictures, he noticed that the Crab Nebula was stand, uh, expanding. And this is from his 20, 1921 paper and you can see stuff moving out there. So that was of interest. And then the same year, uh, Newt Lundmark noted that it was proximity, its proximity to the guest star of uh, uh, 1054. It was later shown to be uh, the Crab Nebula was a core collapse supernova. This was done by Nicholas uh, Mayel and uh, some of you might recognize that name. He was the director of Kitt Peak Observatory for a long time and their beautiful uh, uh, three point, uh, I don't know if it's 3.8 meter telescope, uh, it's a male telescope named after him. But he uh, in the thirties was the first person to take spectrograph of certain portions of the Crab Nebula. And uh, that uh, provided enough information to think that, yeah, this might be a supernova. It was still kind of um, in development at the time. The one thing about uh, uh, Mayo was that he got his uh, PhD in 1929. And in 1930, the uh, depression hit and his first job in astronomy was hired as a janitor of Lick Observatory. And for a year or two, he had to sweep the floors and keep the place tidy. So it was kind of a humble beginning to a very successful career. And he did so much work. Um, in 1968, the Crab Pulsar was discovered. And it was a rapidly rotating neutron star and observed uh, pulses every 33 milliseconds. And uh, this generated great interest when it was discovered. Um, and there's a, so there's kind of a, a two things going on. There's a supernova remnant uh, that uh, 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 expelled all of this uh, matter from the center of the supernova. And then there's this pulsar wind and it's forming shock waves as it encounters the, uh, the particles from the supernova and it's creating all sorts of complex structures. Really a, an interesting uh, uh, subject itself. And it's located uh, 6,300 light years away in Taurus and the, the beauty of this thing right now is that we can get the radio velocity from measurements of the uh, various uh, portions of the Crab Nebula. And we can get determine the angular expansion 
as, as we've seen, it started at 1054 and moved outwards. Uh, we can get an idea of what its velocity of there. So if you've got a radial velocity and some of it showing uh, part of the Crab Nebula receding and other stuff moving ahead towards you, you're getting enough information to create a 3D model. And um, the, 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 the great thing here is that um, I'm going to try and uh, wish me well on this. I'm going to try and show you this is something that uh, uh, the PhD student uh, worked up a beautiful um, uh, animation showing a 3D model because they took all of this stuff and it's incredibly high resolution. And the reason it's in high resolution is that they have this wonderful thing called Satel that allowed them to get, get this, 310,000 individual spectrographs from uh, spectrograms from the Crab Nebula and they put it all together and stand back. You might notice that it's kind of got a heart shape uh, to it. It's not uh, spheroidal. It's quite a complex structure and they can go right in there and they're finding so many new things with this, uh, with all sorts of different filaments and interaction of shock waves and, and, and things like that. And this is a, a fairly low resolution animation. On a website, they have a even higher one that you could download, but I was afraid to bring things down on my website. So uh, I'll just go back here now. So I, I, I hope you uh, were as excited to see that as I was. And this is a spectacular tool that allows people to gain a lot more understanding of what is really going on in here. So if you want to find out more, just go to the Canadian French Hawaii Telescope uh, website and uh, in the news, they have Heart of the Crab. And they've got a great little story here about what this is like. And they have a link to the paper that was delivered in uh, uh, the area. And Thomas Martin, in, in particular, he was the guy who wrote a lot of the code that allowed us them to process this data. And it was part of his PhD project. So it's really, really quite extraordinary. So. Moving on, but the big thing is, it's great to find out what is uh, done, but almost as, in, as interesting is how do you do it? How do you obtain over 300,000 high resolution spectrographs in about one session? And so this thing really is not as much about the Crab Nebula as it is the magic of Satel. So uh, let me just go ahead. So if you want to find out about Satel, I just Google Satel. And the first thing you find out is Satel is the name of a bird. <laughs> so they've got uh, a little uh, icon here for uh, this bird, Satel. And it's uh, a very complicated uh, process, really. It's called the Imaging Four Fourier Transform Spectrometer is what they're calling this thing. And uh, it uh, uh, basically was uh, unrolled unroll out in around 2016 and they did some testing with it. And, but I found what was really interesting and helpful was the thing here called the FTS primer. So that's what I ended up doing. And uh, the, the Satel primer, um, it's a little bit uh, heavy going, but I, I found it interesting. But before we go into the, how this system works, let's talk about how the old way of doing things were. Uh, stellar spe spectra were usually obtained using a prism or a diffraction grating. And uh, this is an image of the uh, uh, first spectrograph that was hanging on the, uh, in the Cassegrain uh, uh, end of the 72 inch uh, DAO telescope. And um, so basically what they do is they pass starlight, uh, sometimes they have a cylindrical lens or something, pass the starlight through a slit and this slit passes through uh, the prism and the prism spreads out the light and uh, uh, they have a, a photograph of this usually in a, a curved holder to uh, get everything linear. 
And uh, this was very effective in that this was the state of the art uh, um, a spectrograph, I believe, in, in that uh, at the time the DAO uh, rolled out. The other option is to pass again the light through this uh, slit and uh, it hits the collimating mirror and it hits a, a diffraction grating. And uh, this uh, will cause uh, uh, the light to break up into uh, wavelengths and it's captured by a camera and put onto a detector such as a CCD de detector or in the olden days they had uh, uh, big, uh, they had glass plates. Now, the interesting thing is that the grading spectrograph on the 48 inch is really big and it takes up the whole floor of the building. And it would be really neat to have a tour of that building someday. Maybe some of you have seen that, but uh, the, the glass plates, when they used uh, uh, a film as a thing, the, the glass plates for these uh, uh, spectrographs, I think were about 18 inches long, really long things. So they have very high resolution, which is important. So that's, a, that's the uh, two, two systems that I was familiar with. So how do they do it with this? Uh, Satel uses a variation of a thing called the Mikkelsen, Mikkelsen uh, infer, interferometer. And some of you might have heard of the, uh, the um, Mikkelsen-Morley uh, famous test that proved that uh, the speed of light is constant in every direction. And in order to prove that, they used a thing called an interferometer to uh, accurately measure things. And the way that this works is in this case here, we have a laser. They did this well before they had a laser. But you have a laser and they have a beam splitter, which is basically a semi-transparent piece of glass that allows some of the light to pass through in this mirror and bounces uh, back and it goes down to the detector. Meanwhile, they have some of the light hitting this mirror and it goes down. Now, one of these mirrors is fixed. The other one can move. And what you're doing is having, sometimes you have the light in phase and sometimes you have it out of phase. So you uh, basically have uh, light from the uh, first optical path and the second optical optical path combining. And if they're in phase, they add. If they are out of phase, they uh, have destructive interference. So that's why it's called an interferometer. So that's basically the original system, uh, how, how it sort of worked. And uh, so this is an example, don't, don't worry about the integrals up here, but they have a couple of things. OPD stands for optical path difference. And what they're doing is that they have a one fixed mirror and one mirror that can move and they're changing the optical distance uh, between uh, of the paths. And that's uh, what's on the X axis here. And so we have one thing here which is basically a, a single color. And they, we have this thing called FT, which is a Fourier transform. And I don't completely understand all of the mathematics myself, but basically a complex signal can be approximated by adding up a collection of periodic curves, basically sine waves of various frequencies. And this is called a Fourier series named after the French mathematician. And these show up in so many applications in science, a pretty fantastic thing. But they have another uh, gadget called the Fast Fourier Transform that uh, was developed in around 1965. It was when computers became more powerful. And it had the ability of taking up a jumble up bunch of uh, different colors. And when they add all of the colors together, you're gonna have an intensity varies like this. And what it does, it has the ability to take this complicated waveform and break it down into the individual wavelengths and the amplitudes of these wavelengths, which is just an incredibly powerful technique. And um, so this is an example of what happens. Um, basically, if you have uh, uh, these mirrors and you take a picture and then you move the mirror a little bit and take another picture. These pictures will uh, have kind of a combination of the two 
uh, wavelengths, so uh, two, two uh, sources of uh, information. One uh, being a fixed mirror and the other mirror moving a very small amount. And in this case, we move the mirror 14 times and we have a spectrum that we create using the fast Fourier tan transform. And you can see it's quite a coarse spectrum. Here is a case where you have 64 steps of the mirror and you get a more complicated waveform and you have a greater detail in the spectrum that comes out. And there is another one with 120 steps of the mirror. Um, and uh, you can see uh, it's getting even more uh, uh, jagged and very much sharper resolution of the spectra. And here's a case with 320 steps of the mirror this interferogram re, uh, results in uh, something that looks more like the spectra that we are dealing with. Now, the step of each of these mo movements of the mirror is about the half the wavelength distance, uh, the distance, so it's really tiny. Uh, so, so I hope you understand that this is one way uh, without using uh, spectrographic gratings or prisms where you can get another way of getting a spectrum. And uh, when I saw this, I thought, wow, this is a clever idea, I tell you. So this is what the uh, uh, Sattel system is like. And Sattel is some sort of acronym in uh, the French language. And uh, I did not try to figure it out. So essentially what you have is if, if you imagine that this is the uh, hole in the Cassegrain um, mirror of the uh, six point uh, or three point six meter Canada French Hawaii telescope. What happens is the light comes down here. It hits the beam splitter here. Half of the stuff goes down through uh, through the mirror and or the beam splitter, and it bounces off and it comes out to a detector here, detector number one. And then the other half of the light comes down and it reflects off the beam splitter and it hits this mirror here and comes out to detector number two. The big deal is that this mirror moves and it moves very accurately because they have a piezo actuator here, sort of probably sort of like the technology they're using with the variable mirrors in the, uh, 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 the when they're trying to uh, get rid of uh, the uh, turbulence uh, with all of their new adaptive optics. So that's basically it. So you end up with two images and you can have one, one image there is the, uh, the, the pure image. And then you have something that is in the two images together create a, an interference pattern. And you just keep adding, uh, doing, taking more and more of these images. It takes, it doesn't take, it takes only a couple of minutes to do one image, but they take an awful lot of them and you just have to get the, the everything just right. So is, is they can do it in one night if they're lucky. Sometimes it's uh, several nights when they get the exposure. So, uh, and this is what they talk about a cube comes out. So this is what the spatial image looks like here. But if you go back here, this is where they had all of that information from all the interferograms, interferograms, and they used uh, the fast Fourier transform system. And uh, uh, Thomas Martin wrote this program, and it takes about twelve hours on a fast pr computer to uh, to process that. And in the case of the uh, uh, the Crab Nebula, it was three hundred and ten thousand different spectrographs that they got there. So let's look at this for a second. Let's say we got a pixel here. Back in here on this spectral cube, we have actually ended up, once it's all processed, we have a spectrum for that particular spot. And here's another place. We have another lo location. We have a different spectrum. And you can see the difference in the different uh, spectra. Uh, the great thing with the uh, Crab Nebula is there's a lot of emission nebula uh, so there's a lot of bright sources to process. So I hope that, that sort of well makes a bit of sense of how that works. So this is what it looks like. And they've got about five terrific instruments that they've designed for the Canadian French Hawaii telescope. And this is Sattel. And it was attached uh, 
in uh, 2016 to the telescope. So you can see it's a fairly large thing and there's a big box of electronics that goes along with it as well. And I've got here 3.8 meters, it's actually 3.6 meter telescope. My apologies there. And um, I just wanted to show you an example. This is the ring nebula. This is, they took a picture of the ring nebula. And this shows you the radio velocities that they're getting inside the ring nebula. And you can see a positive uh, radio velocity of 17 kilometers per second moving towards us. And here we have uh, a receding uh, at uh, 34 kilometers per second over here very high resolution in this thing. And the uncertainty they think is around 50 meters per second. So we're talking kilometers per second, very accurate because the resolution of the spectra is very good. So this is one example of what you can get from Satel. Now we had a group from our astrophotography group, uh, uh, we're working on the ring nebula recently. And one thing here, there's the ring nebula here, but some of the guys were picking up a very faint object here, a very distant galaxy here that's quite a, far, a bit farther away, of course, than the, the uh, ring nebula, uh, which is a planetary nebula and it's very close by. And the interesting thing here, they were able to pick up this signal here from the distant galaxy and get a velocity curve from this and also the abundance of the metals in that thing and just shows you the power of this instrument. It's just wonderful. And I'm absolutely stoked by it. Um, and this is uh, possibly the last slide, but what it does is show you the uh, compared velocity measurements. Uh, and then this was taken from a section of M31, which is fairly close. And they had other spectra that took uh, radio velocities from that. And it shows you that this new instrument is really quite uh, uh, very, very accurate. Um, there was basically, uh, in, in this uh, case, they had 86 cases where the velocity of the velocities were quite compatible and they were uh, very, uh, very happy with it. So it's in its early days. So we, they've, they've looked at the crab. You've seen what they've done with that. And there's all sorts of insight and modeling and stuff that they're gonna be doing with that. They've looked at the several other objects, uh, uh, mainly um, supernova remnants and uh, planetary nebula, but they're also looking at some other galaxies as well. So this is a really brand new tool in the toolbox. And uh, as a note of pride, it's got a, 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 a Canadian heritage to it as well. So with that, I will try and end the show. Reg, yeah. one major slide thing. There was an interesting thing on your second to last slide. Uh, this one? Yeah. Oh, well, one before that. Yeah. So that picture, is is this N2? No, this is the uh, M57, the ring nebula. No, is it nitrogen 2 um, forbidden uh, spectra that we're looking at? Uh, this is the radio velocity calibration uh, from uh, the uh, the fields for every pixel in the image. Is that an answer? Okay. The, the, the N2 in square brackets at the top. Oh, N2. Uh, that that is uh, that is uh, they they have several lines in that. In this case. It was uh, uh, nitrogen two. Uh, they also uh, picking up oxygen two, I believe, and uh, of course um, hydrogen alpha. So uh, that's what they're picking. But this this particular one is N two, I guess. Yes. So Sorry. that picture in the upper left, that helical structure that's in the ring nebula. Yeah. Is that caused by N two? No, I think what you've got is a variety of different uh, uh, things. This, this 
the radial velocities came from this particular thing. This is probably a composite of a variety of different colors. They did not really specify that in the document. Okay. All right. I'll stop the share. That's really good. That David, really you said it was a um, forbidden line. Is that what you just said earlier? Yeah, that's what the square brackets mean. It's, it's <laughs> forbidden is a strong word. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if you could tell us what that meant. Um, so normally nitrogen doesn't emit at that spectral line unless it's very low density. And so the collisions that are required for if, if it collides often enough, then, then it won't emit at that spectral line. But because it's at a very low density, these collisions don't happen very often. And it has no other way to get rid of the, the nitrogen ion has no way of getting rid of its energy than to emit uh, a spectral line that is normally forbidden. So it's like a, a, a poorly behaved child. <laughs> Just on a more mundane note about uh, Fourier series and Fourier transforms, uh, it, it's quite it became quite common quite a while back in, in uh, audio business, uh, sound, sound uh, analysis. Uh, you could take a very complex audio signal and using Fourier's, Fourier uh, analysis, you could break it down into discrete individual frequencies. And then you could use the discrete frequencies in reverse to create the original audio signal. Uh, what they've used that for in the commercial audio business is you go into a, a, a space, an acoustic space, and you fire off an impulse, which would be a, a shot with, from a pistol, and you measure this, the, the sound at a particular location, you break that down using FFT, and then you can build a piece of electronics that will simulate the hall when it's fed through your normal stereo system. So as Gary has a surround sound system, uh, he would be able to have multiple speakers that would feed that hall acoustic uh, adjustment to the sound that's coming, coming off his source. So it gives you that, that 3D uh, sound space that you hear when you go to a concert uh, through using Fast Fourier. Yep. Pretty nifty nifty. I can't yep. claim to understand it, but it works like a whistle. Yep. Uh, Fast Fourier is also used with the chime uh, data. So yes. the chime data is, is of course, uh, pretty intense stuff. And uh, they're using uh, it to beam form the uh, fast radio bursts that are being detected by the CHIME telescope. So that's uh, all, all tied together uh, with the uh, extreme data processing, I guess is what you call it. <laughs> it's also extensively used in neuroscience, very extensively. Yep. Yeah, Fourier was a brilliant guy, and uh, his, his uh, mathematical tools are very useful. I, I read control, up on control, control system theory, too. I, I read up on Fourier, and he's an interesting guy. Yes. Um, he hung out with Napoleon, and he yep. went down to Egypt, and he set up, uh, hired an Egyptologist, and founded the uh, whole process of uh, studying the, the past uh, historical Egyptian. Uh, um, culture, but in another thing, he didn't get along too well with some of his uh, his uh, compatriots, uh, 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 Laplace and uh, people like that. Didn't think too highly of him, so he was kind of a Rodney Dangerfield of uh, <laughs> French mathematics. I, I don't think he got the the um, the uh, credit he deserved, but he certainly is. A, uh, he's almost everywhere. He's, he's popping up everywhere. I first came across the fa Fourier, fast Fourier transfer uh, when uh, it was used in uh, the petroleum industry in about 1970. Mm -hmm. they, they used that to process all of the seismic data that was coming in. Yeah, 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 another place, yeah.
Quite interesting. Hello, Michelle, how are you doing? <laughs> very good. Well, thanks very much, Reg. Um, any more questions or comments on that? Otherwise, I guess, Lori, you are up next. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to, because we're not meeting next week, um, I just wanted to um, invite people to come out to the uh, next FDA Star Party, which will be held on um, Saturday, the 7th of um, August. And our, our guest speaker is the one and only Dorothy Paul. Yay, Dorothy, who's going to be uh, doing some work on on um, searching for life here and elsewhere, which kind of puts it just about everywhere. So uh, we'll be we'll be working we'll be working to have uh, have her uh, do a presentation for us. So thank you, Dorothy, for taking this on, and uh, that will be the that will be the seventh. And um, then the other uh, the other thing that I wanted to um, uh, in kind of just if you could put in your in the back of your head or on your calendar that we are going to be um, uh, planning for a, a little memorial for Diane um, at the Aviation Museum on the uh, 15th. Uh, it's a, it's a, the Sunday, the 15th of um of august um at about one o'clock we haven't quite got exactly the time done but it would be about one o'clock or so um uh diane we're going to be making sure that diane's family is uh, presented with her service medal that she got from the resc and we're hoping that um that we can just have a little bit of time to um have some reminisces and uh and then at the um after that is finished, we've got a room. We've got one of the. We've got a specific room at the museum where we can we can hold it, and it will hold um, you know like twenty five people or so. So I mean, quite a lot of people can come. Um, and uh, uh, then afterwards, um, uh, Gord Bell, who is Diane's as um, brother, um, is going to um, help with a tour of the aviation museum. Um, uh, Diane was very very interested in aviation and was a real was a real airplane <laughs> airplane geek as well as astro astronomy person and uh so that's really kind of important there chuck feltness will is also um, a member of the aviation museum and is going to help out there as well so uh we're going to have a meeting tomorrow just to do some uh some uh, planning and um i'm i'm hoping that we'll be able to get uh to get lots of people out um to come so that sunday the um, 15th of August um, at about one o'clock in the afternoon at, um, at the Aviation Museum. So I hope you can put that in your calendar and come out. Thank you. Yes, yes Laurie uh, and everyone, the, the, the verb is prospecting for life. Oh, I'm sorry, prospecting, yes. And that, that's a Important. It is, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I didn't have the I didn't have it right up in front of me. So looking forward to it, Dorothy. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lori. Uh, any questions from anybody? Okay, so I think we're on to Randy. Cool. I will share the screen. Um this follows very nicely with Reg's because um, completely different subject, but the same sort of outline. Uh, talking about something amazing up in the sky that we know something about, and then uh, going through its history of observation and then taking a look at new technology. So um, let's get this going. So some. Centaurus uh, is not a easy um, constellation to find. It's way off in the south. Uh, and when, when I saw that there was this article about the uh, Centaurus A galaxy, I uh, asked Gary, because I knew that there were windows in his observatory that um, allowed something low uh, 
uh, elevation. Um, and he told me that, in fact, it was the, he calls them Omega Centauri windows for this Gobbler cluster, which is down at 47 degrees south. And Centaurus A, the galaxy, is only at 43. So um, at some point, Gary, we, we uh, hope to see your wonderful photo of this. Uh, it's on my list. It's on your list. Good. So, so much to you, see, so little time. If you lived in Australia, then you could pull off a uh, picture of uh, Centaurus like this with Alpha Centauri, the uh, famous closest star. Actually, the really closest is a, um, a it's part of a uh, binary system or a ternary system. And somewhere around here is, is Proxima Centauri. But Alpha Centauri is the big one. And they point to the Southern Cross. And these guys kind of tell you where South is if you're clever. But way here in the body of the center, you have the globular cluster. And you have this little fuzzball here. It's not that small. It's actually the third brightest galaxy out there after the um, uh, Andromeda. And is it the Triangulum is number two? Uh, here's a wonderful picture, and it kind of shows you the, the coincidences of the sky, because here Omega Centauri is 16 kilolight years away, and a thousand times further away is Centaurus A at 12 mega light years. So uh, when you're looking for fuzzballs, they can be very, very different. Anyway, focusing on Centaurus A, what really is beautiful about it, it's, an, um, it's got these dust bands going right through the middle of it. I think it's absolutely spectacular. But if you go back, it was uh, discovered by James Dunlop in 1880. <coughs> and uh, he certainly recognized those dust bands, but he drew it like it was two separate things. And these are his notes. I just love these, you know, a most superb calm night Objects admirably defined, shown to a bystander who saw it as figured and, des and described. And it's two nebulae or two portions of one separated by a division or cut. And then he talks about how it's like uh, there's no moonlight effect. It, this is how to take notes. I think that's just great. Uh, the internal edges have a gleaming light like the moonlight touching the outline in a transparency. Then a uh, decade or so later in South Africa, John Herschel drew something where he, he was closer to seeing those bands. I, I just love this. This is just from the eyepiece. These, these people were really, really fine uh, drawers of observers and drawers. Anyway, that, that, that's great. It's the third brightest galaxy out there. And uh, the only reason it doesn't have an M number is probably because it's too far south. And so, uh, Poor Mr. Messier didn't have a chance to see it. Um, but then things get more interesting in 1947 when they set up a radio telescope in Australia. Um, somehow these wibbles told Bolton, Stanley, and Slee that there was a bright object in the direction of. Uh, of uh, the uh, Centaurus A. And then another few years after that, they were able to actually map it out. And of course, uh, they, they've continued to uh, perfect the techniques. And this is this wonderful combination. Invisible uh, is kind of a true colors, they called it. But superimposed is x-rays in blue and infrared in orange. And it's got these huge jets. So it's a radio, x-ray, infrared. It's, it's, it's a very, very active galaxy. And uh, it's only 13 uh, mega light years away. So it's the closest radioactive um, galaxy out there. OK. And then those jets, it, it, 
is part of the proof that these galaxies have a supermassive black hole in the middle. And as stuff is going around and around and getting sucked into the uh, black hole, then um, you get these jets that are focused along magnetic lines going out and they shine bright. And this is the a baby quasar. If they get even bigger, then they outshine the whole galaxy. And uh, th that's what these quasars are that, are, that um, are these really bright synchrotron radiation sort of uh, sources out uh, even in early, um, the early universe that are, are kind of beacons that, that are visible. Anyway, this is somewhere in between the kind of Milky Way sort of galaxy and the, um, you know, the really uh, supermassive uh, quasars, you get the, these sorts of intermediate steps. So that brings us to the Event Horizon Telescope, which uh, we talked about last year when the, uh, the famous donut made it into the news. And uh, so they had these telescopes all over the world pointing the same direction at the same time. They, they found four days in April where the telescopes were available and the weather was good enough that they could um, collect data together. And so during those four days, they had a couple of days that they looked at M87, the um, center of the Virgo supercluster of galaxies. And it has a uh, black hole in the middle, which I don't know, it's in, it's in the billions of solar masses, as opposed to the center of the Milky Way, Sagittarius A, which is only millions of solar masses. And they've promised that they will show us images of this. But that's not the second target that got published. It's actually Centaurus A, which just got published uh, last week. Anyway, let, let's talk a bit about why it's interesting. These are slides that I showed when the donut got published. So angular resolution is uh, this, you know, how, how fine you can see something is the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation divided by the diameter of your telescope. And so, for example, the Hubble telescope looking in the infrared has about a 0.1 arc second resolution. Well, let's say you want to get 25 micro arc second resolution. Well, if you're doing visible light, you're going to need something like a uh, five kilometer diameter uh, mirror, which uh, I don't think is ever going to happen. But radio telescopes, they can see around a millimeter, which is interesting because you often think about these, you know, 21 centimeter for hydrogen or, you know, much larger um, radio wavelengths. But, but uh, the the um, Event Horizon Telescope is based on 1.3 millimeter. And so in order to get 25 micro arc second, then all you need is a 25, a 20,000 kilometer dish. That's not too hard, is it? Well, the way you do it is, um, yeah, these are, this is a slide that I invented for, for that last talk. I don't think anybody else has ever presented it like this, but you know, you have all these different telescopes looking at um, at the object, and so if this were like a the thirty meter telescope with all these little facets, it's kind of like you only put a few of them up, and while you don't have as much light coming into your secondary, you've got enough information to have the same resolution as the thirty meter telescope, and that's exactly what's happening with these six or so um, radio uh, dishes around the world. So from the South Pole to Greenland, from Spain uh, to South America and Mexico, um, an amazing uh, bit of technology. 
a huge amount of data, much too much for internet. It's actually sneaker net. They actually stored the data on disks and flew them to where they got analyzed physically, because there's no way that there's you can transfer it um, that that data except physically on on it on the disks. Anyway, so July 19th, just last week, I uh, in Nature Astronomy. So it starts off looking like there's a lot of authors, but it gets even better because there's also the Event Horizon Telescope Consortium or collaborators, and then and then it goes up to here and there's something like 123 different institutions. It's just, it's just like, you know, I publish papers maybe with six authors, but uh, this is a lot of authors. And uh, so here's the picture. So it doesn't look like the donut at all. Um, that's interesting. How far is Virgo? What's, it, what's its distance? Um, I don't remember, but this this is the final picture. They they go in the paper about all the different ways they they had different teams image it, and then they look for what's the same and what's different between the way different people independently took the data. Anyway, this was the final version of, of what um, they were looking at, and um, here here's the inside. And the way they figure out where the middle is, it's kind of weird. They fit straight lines to the, the this is called the jet and this is called the contra jet. This is going away from us, from the viewing, and this is coming towards us. And so they figured that the center has to be between these two blue lines and has to be between these two white lines. And so they say, so it's likely here. Um, and then they're really keen on talking about how it's really just partway between the physics that you see in Virgo A in Virgo um, the the um, M87 M37, um, which is uh, a, a thousand times bigger than the Milky Way's supermassive uh, black hole. This one is somewhere in the middle, and they they say. And look, the physics is kind of similar. So that, that's, that's, that's as far as I can tell from what they're, they're talking about. But uh, it's, a, it's a great bit of uh, international uh, collaboration to solve what really is an amazing problem. Thank you. Questions or comments? Presentation. Eight. You, Gary, can actually, we you can actually see this. Centaurus A in an eight inch telescope. I'm sorry? You can see Centaurus A in an eight inch telescope from New Zealand. I think that very first observation that, that uh, Mr. Dunlop did it with uh, something about that size, but with speculum. So it yeah. wasn't even that reflective. Yeah. Have you seen it? Yes. When I lived in New Zealand, that was one of the targets, first targets. And could you see the, uh, the, the band through it clearly? Yeah, it was quite obvious, actually. Ooh. Nice. <clears throat> it's easy to see in binoculars as well. Yeah, you can see it. I don't know that you see the band very well, but certainly in the telescope at reasonable power, you can see the band quite clearly. <clears throat> And Gary, you said you can only see it in March. Sorry, um, it Omega Cent Omega Centauri peaks as it peaks up <coughs> above the horizon about fifteen degrees. I think sometime in March. Uh, well, it's actually there a lot of the time, but that's the only time I'm down there. And one morning, Diane Bell woke me up at four o'clock in the morning and dragged me out there. I'll never forget that. <laughs> It was freezing, but we got our we got our photons anyhow. And yeah. this is about four degrees higher up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I'm keen to get it someday. Uh, Diane uh, woke me up as well. Uh, <laughs> it was the size of the moon. It was just beautiful. <laughs> and me as well. Yes. Oh, you, you too. Okay, there you go. <laughs> 
as a radio target, it's six degrees ac across. Very neat. Well, thank you, Randy. Um, I think we're over to David. Yeah, just a reminder that uh, there's two SIGs going on next week. Uh, oh, actually, there's, there's a SIG uh, uh, on Wednesday of this week, actually. That's, uh, Joe, are you hosting uh, in uh, John's absence? I think you are. Yes, uh, I am. Uh, so yeah, just a reminder that uh, we're all bringing our Venus photos uh, for Wednesday. Um, next week, uh, we have the beginner SIG on Tuesday and uh, EAA on Thursday. Um, I don't really have any topics for those two SIGs yet, so. Yeah, on this, on the imaging SIG this Wednesday, I'll be giving a- Oh, intro that's right. To, in, intro to PixInsight. So anybody that wants to start using it or just become a little bit more familiar with it, uh, come on along. Uh, it turns out you don't have to use all of their crazy functions, like there's only about 2 million of them. You can get by with about, I'd say 10 and you're good, so. I'll be, um, I have an eight emit, I have an eight sub um, session of the Ring Nebula. So we'll be zipping through that pretty quickly and you'll see what we, you'll see what you can do pretty quickly with it. And, and, and do let uh, the leads of each SIG know if you're interested because uh, you won't get the Zoom link unless you do that. Um, so yeah, for the beginners group, uh, I'm hoping there'll be some, maybe some discussions about how we might start getting together. I mean, there's certainly uh, probably places where we can go and maybe uh, uh, do some something that's a, a, a kind of a group kind of thing. Um, I We've gone through gear for the last little while, but I, I don't know if there's any other things that we want to talk about. Um, I did, I, I did uh, start using um, my encoder based uh, uh, alt as mount recently. So I might, maybe I might talk about that. Um, there's also the variable star stuff, but I'm hoping to maybe reserve that for maybe an Astro Cafe night. Um, EAA, um, getting darker now. So um, hopefully, uh, we haven't really been doing EAA at the Saturday star parties because it's just been too light, but uh, it is getting darker. So uh, a group of us will be starting to sort of uh, put our heads together as to what we're gonna do uh, for the rest of the summer. Uh, and that's, I think that's about it. So if you're interested in any of those things, make sure you contact the leads and uh, that information is actually on the website. Great, thank you. Uh, David. Yes. Um, maybe for the sake, for the beginners uh, SIG, we could um, look over some of the Nova, the Nova's topics and see whether or not that's um, oh yeah like yeah. what's going on there and yeah. and have people kind of look in some of the things there yeah. and see whether that's it's jiving with what they with what they would yeah like. i can so. i can certainly speak to the ones i'm involved mm -hmm. in and, mm -hmm. and actually maybe between the two of us we can maybe yeah. describe the basic sections of nova yeah so yeah yeah no that's an excellent idea because um uh you have an opportunity to provide input into nova um i mean certainly we're gonna sort of put our own heads together in terms of our past experience, but maybe maybe it's just as important to find out what people want to know as opposed to what we're willing to tell you, right? So uh, if there are things that uh, you're curious about or, or you would want more inf information on, let us know. Maybe, maybe it'll end up in Nova. Yeah, th thanks, Laurie, about that. Okay, um, anybody else have anything? I was just going to ask Gloria if she knew what the uh, total attendance was on Saturday night because uh, I was in through YouTube, there was probably eight or nine on that, but uh, hopefully there were more coming through the other site. Um. Yes, it, it, there was there were there were a few more coming through on the Zoom. Um, we uh, it was a it was a fairly small elite crowd, 
um, <laughs> on Saturday night, but that's fine. I mean, we, we, uh, we <clears throat> realize that, um, that there's lots of other things going on and people, you know, with things opening up and, uh, and other people going to other, you know, other functions and stuff that we may, that we may not, but we, every single day we have, we have somebody who comes on our website to say, hi, when are you opening? You know, I, I want to come up. So I think once we get open, uh, we'll continue to have the, 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 um, the, the strong attendance, but just right now the, the virtual is not quite as, um, as not, uh, quite as popular, but that's fine. We're, we're happy to, uh, to, um, do what we can. So yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to compete with, uh, real life. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Now Lori, yeah. I watched it after the fact, so I'm not in that number, you know, there's going to be a lot of people right we're watching the uh youtube later on and i think that's what i think um amy amy archer uh keeps track of that kind of those kind of um that kind of data so uh, we can we can have a look at that and dan Thank did you. a fantastic job yeah he yeah fantastic is right just great yeah i think uh i think more to the point uh i think uh a few of us have been discussing this is how we're going to actually blend what we do here with, yes. with real life because yeah. I don't think this is going to disappear. I mean, there are so many good things about um, this connected universe we've created. It's Michelle here, he's not coming to an in-person Astro Cafe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. How would we see him, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so there's there's lots of good reasons, but uh, it means probably like twice the work. <laughs> we're gonna have to figure out how we're gonna do this. Yeah, running a hybrid event is uh, challenging to volunteers in particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah even even for the uh, virtual star parties, like I think we always struggled with having at times too many people on the hill, and you, you know, like uh, if we did a little bit of. Um, uh, kind of virtual along with real, I might be just the perfect blend. So we still don't have a date at all <laughs> for when when the federal government will open us up up there. So we're still all just um, just continuing along until we're told else uh, tell, told something else. So actually, how how are people feeling about getting together? Are people feeling more amenable to it or or, or not? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, some people are more more than ready. <laughs> yeah, I spent uh, one night with a cheerful bunch. I think we were a total of five. Uh, it was the most fun outside I've had in a year and a half. So yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Literally, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It looks like we've got a late addition um, from Michelle, so that's for tonight. You want to? Yeah, if you want, uh, it's going to sure. be just a few minutes. Yeah, Hi, so why not? We, it's nice to see you uh, yes. join us, and I know uh, it's I, I, I just need to share, right? Yeah, you should just be able to share and share your desktop. Uh, everybody see that? It's starting up. Yeah, there we are. Ah, uh, your observatory construction. Uh -huh. Yes. All right, so. It's been a, a nightmare <laughs> trying to build that observatory since I'm here because few things. Uh, contractor, uh, the price went up. So uh, I got a couple of submissions, but uh, to build a small ship, it's about like $20,000. You know, uh, the contractor, they just don't want to take the job because it's too expensive. So it's... So I decided to do it myself. So, but it started today. So I can show you basically just, basically what happened on the Thursday. <laughs> so I did, so that is my backyard. So I just put uh, just the mark. So it's gonna be an observatory about, it's gonna be 14 uh, feet by 10. The observatory itself, a room is gonna be 10 by 10 with a small three by 10 odd room because in Quebec, uh, you know, winter it's minus 20. So I need to have a small, uh, a small uh, control room that I can control the temperature a bit. So, um, 
So what I did, so I did basically pre-cut the grass because I didn't want to uh, break all the grass this morning. But as you're going to see, it didn't go well. So I had already some equipment. So in Quebec, because of the frost, I had to put a solar tube about minimum five feet deep. So I didn't take a chance. I put it six feet. But uh, I said, it's going to be easy to do that. I said, why well, I just dig it myself with a, with a shovel and do it. But I decided, you know, what might be a bit crazy. So I went and ran. Uh, some equipment, so cost me about one hundred dollars, and you will see it is worth it. So that is a small. Uh, it's pretty easy. So it cost me one hundred dollars for a full day just to run that. So it's pretty easy. So I did remove the grass, a bit of dirt, and I was getting ready to dig a hole. They said, "I said it's going to be about ten minutes to deal to, to do that." So yeah, the first four. The first four feet took me about 15 minutes. It was so easy, it's pretty easy to control. And say, ah, it's gonna be done quick. So I will be able to put the solar tube and do everything and probably even like put the, the concrete probably at, at the end of the day. And you know what? It, it, it's, it's, it's never working that way. So what happened at four feet, I hit rock, <laughs> but solid one. So on, on the next picture, you can see it's like, uh, I don't know if you see in the middle, it's basically kind of not a big solid rock, but it's, it's kind of really rock, pretty hard to break. So try to, uh, to use the machine to basically break it. Uh, you can see uh, I was kind of successful to break it, but to go from four feet to six feet took me about four hours. Hmm. Well, I didn't work. The machine did the work, but it's, it's kind of, so that is basically the story of my day. So uh, at the end, I was able to put the solar tube in, uh, put the solar tube in, so everything is in. I had the, uh, I was getting ready to prepare basically uh, the, the rest, but uh, the rain came in, so I had to put the cover on everything. In about there, so rain came in, it's like a big storm. So I was getting ready to put the two by six and be ready to uh, to receive. But, I, I, but if you have, if you're on rock, can you not just stop? I mean, why do you have to go lower than rock? I mean, it's solid. You're not going to have to. Know, but, fast. You know what? I, I said I'm going to six feet, so I said I'm ah. going to go. To six feet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, it was a bit hard, but uh, I did. It was fun to uh, basically use that machine. <laughs> so that is my day one. So uh, uh, the rest of the summer, I'm gonna basically work on that project. Uh, I'm sure I'm gonna learn a lot. I already talked to uh, Bruno uh, a couple of times, asking him for advice, uh, talking to Charles. Charles is probably planning to come to help me for a, a long weekend. I had a friend here that uh, is going to help me to do the walls and all that stuff. I have the plan already done. So uh, I'm moving forward. So uh, so that is the day. So today too, uh, I didn't order, but kind of pre-order the equipment. So the equipment is going to be a Paramount MX Plus with a Celestron 14-inch uh, edge and uh, a small... Uh, Refractor uh, only 94, but it's going to be good good enough. So that is pretty much the main equipment that I'm going to put on the, on that observatory. Probably hoping will be complete by October before the snow uh, show up. <laughs> wow. Hey, hey, Michelle, Gary here. Uh, I've done the same thing and made a few mistakes. Um, have you got your conduit in the gravel yet? Uh. It's not there yet, but my plan was to uh, to put it in uh, to uh, uh, before to put the concrete. So at least I'm gonna probably uh, do like what we did at the DCO. So we did four runs, I yeah, think, yeah, from yeah. the pier to the wall. So I'm planning to do two uh, runs. So uh, when I'm gonna put the concrete, uh, I'm just gonna go and put that down, and at least, uh, yeah. 
It might be good to do three runs. Sorry to take up everybody's time. Do three runs, one for power and two for instrumentation. You never know. It's always okay. good to have an extra one. And well, how are you how are you separating your pier from the floor concrete? So the plan right now is uh, I got another two, 16 inch. So uh, I'm gonna put that 16 inch over the 14. So it's gonna be about an inch uh, separation between the pier and the bay yeah, and the, the pad. Yeah, perfect. perfect. And I'm gonna uh, pour like that. Uh, when everything is done, just to make it cl clean, I might buy some uh, foam or something like that just to fill the hole. Yeah, good, good, good. But uh, yeah, so uh, the pier and the pad is, is, is two separate things. Yeah, good, good. Just for vibration, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it'll be a slide roof like the uh, VCO? Yeah, so uh, it's going to be exactly uh, like the VCO with, uh, with uh, the track and the wheels. So it's going to be 14 wheels on each side. Uh, it's going to be, you know, the construction itself is going to be close to the VCO. The main difference, uh, except for the out room, is going to be the trusses. Trusses uh, at the VCO, uh, they're kind of cathedral, if we can say. Uh, me, because of the snow load, I need to put more regular truss that can take a lot of load. So I'm going to put uh, eight regulars, like triangle uh, truss. So, uh, so because of that, uh, and there's a lot of snow in Quebec, so uh, the wall is going to be six uh, feet and three inches high. So it's going to be, it's going to be a bit higher than uh, the VCO just because of the snow. But uh, it's going to be really similar. It's like the construction is pretty close. So Michelle, do you have other astronomers nearby you or? Yeah, or there, is a, there is, a, there is a, a, a small astronomy club in Rimouski. There's probably, I would say 35 members. Uh, five of them, they're really, really active. Uh, Three of them have their own observatory with Paramount. Uh, it's like uh, about the same kind of equipment that I have. So uh, it's gonna. So there's three that are really in, in, involved. So there's not that many observatories, but uh, but that's actually pretty good for the number of people in total. Oh, it, it is a small town, 40, uh, about fifty thousand people. So it's a small club, but uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, so. She's, Hey, Michelle, give me a call if you want me to tell you what not to do, which you might find helpful. <laughs> well, you know what? Just uh, give me your phone number, and for sure I'm going to call you because I, sometimes I have a lot of questions. Uh, I forward questions to Charles and sometimes to Bruno, but, uh, you know, it's like there's, there's always question. Yeah, it's sure. like the, the question of the day was uh, how I'm going to attach the walls to the concrete pad. So the rule is if you're using wedge anchor, the one that they expand, you know, the problem with that is it's minimum the distance from the bowl to the edge of the concrete is five times the diameter of that. So I'm using two by four. So because I'm using two by four, the only size I can use is three eight. So I was thinking is three eight is and, and, and enough. I said, if I want to go half inch, I'm going to be too close to the edge when I'm going to tie it. Maybe the concrete's going to crack. So the idea that came in is why I don't use a two by six just for the, uh, just for the bottom plate, not for the walls, like a two by six on the bottom plate and build my walls two by four. That gives me an extra seven eight of an inch. And because of that, I can go with an half inch anchor bolt. Good idea. Let's take this offline. I'm, I'm sure people yeah. don't know. So uh, have you got a pen handy? I'll give you my phone number. Yeah, I, I got it. Ready? Okay, 778-867-8667. Seven, seven, eight. Seven, seven, eight. Eight, seven. Eight, five, four, three. Eight, five, four, three. Okay. Great. Yeah, because you know, uh, I never build anything, never, 
I, I never even built like a shed or anything. So I'm doing everything on my own by reading a lot. Good for you. Good for you. So every advice. So when is the best time normally to call you? Uh, anytime. Anytime. Okay. For you, anytime. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to probably try to call you sometime uh, tomorrow. I would say maybe uh, before lunch. Okay, sure. Yep, that's fine. Uh, don't uh, forget three hours. Five don't, in the morning call. Uh, don't forget three hours difference. Oh, yeah, I know that. <laughs> okay, good. Hi, <laughs> right, thanks. Okay. Very good. Well, thanks, Michelle. And you, you did make good progress today. That's really neat to see. So, congratulations. But it's going to be something else. You know, there's always something. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, as you, you found rock where you weren't expecting it. And yeah, as you say, there's always going to be something else. But well done. Um, just before we go today, um, Gary had a question too. Um, if you look in the chat function, and I guess everybody but Joe, who's on the club account, um, who can, with whom may you chat? If you choose chat, who do you get? Do you get everybody or only some people? We seem to be having, uh, maybe this is a new feature in Zoom. But as the person, I can see everybody's name individually. So I can send a group message or I can email or message each of you individually. Does everybody have that or only? That's the thing, yeah. Yeah. Everyone, Chris and Russ, Victoria. Yeah, that's Joe tonight. And that's, yeah, that's all you can't do individual people. Yeah, that's right. That's what I have to. So some people have uh, only Russ, Victoria and me, I said. Everyone. Oh, yeah, that, oh, yeah, that is true. That is what I have to. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. everyone. And everyone. Yeah. Well, that's mm -hmm. interesting. And I knew that because um, I actually was trying to do an individual message message <laughs> to a couple of people tonight to get something ready for tomorrow, and I couldn't do it because so I realized I I was I'm going to have to yeah. phone a couple of people afterwards. I'll have a look at that and see if that's a Zoom setting or that may be something new and. Uh, you know, one of their latest releases. So we'll, we'll see. Maybe it's a privacy yeah. thing. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it could be. I know they're, you know, they keep upping the, uh, you know, security and stuff to try and, you know, like at one point you didn't need passwords. Now you do and on and on. Anyways, well, um, that ended up being, um, I wasn't sure we were going to have too much content for tonight, but that turned out to be very interesting. So thank you everyone for presenting. And again, well done, Michelle. That, uh, that looked fun probably playing with your little uh, digger there too. <laughs> And a hundred dollars, that was worth it. There it is. <laughs> Very good. Anyways, um, so a reminder that we aren't here next week. And uh, John uh, McDonald will be the host for uh, August the 9th. So, which will be the next one we're back. Um, so we'll be uh, sending out, remember there are uh, some SIG meetings this week. Uh, and next week, I guess it is. And another star party on, let's make sure I get the date right, that's on the 7th, right, Lori? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, and um, enjoy the long weekend coming up, and hopefully everybody's staying well, and uh, we're getting a little closer. Uh, uh, oh, for those people who didn't see, we have, um, we have our, secured our space for Astro Cafe for September, uh, so we will uh, be looking at what we can do as we get a little closer to that time, but I think there will continue to be a Zoom component for Astro Cafe, certainly as we've mentioned before. So just a reminder that we'll uh, look into that and, um, but hopefully those who want to and are able will be able to return to a in-person setting as well. Anyways, I think that's it for this evening. So thank you for attending and- Thanks everybody. Take, take care, everyone. Bye. Good night. Thanks, Chris.